Hello, my name is James Broom. I'm the Director of Engineering at a UK-based technology consultancy called Engine. We're Microsoft Gold Partners for Cloud, for DevOps, for Data Platform, for Data Analytics, and we're also Power BI Partners. That means we do lots of work uh, in Azure for our customers, uh, specifically around data analytics. And over the past couple of years, that's meant lots of work inside Azure Synapse. Over the next 10 minutes, uh, I'm going to talk specifically about one feature of Synapse called uh, Synapse SQL Serverless. I'm going to talk about how you can use uh, Synapse SQL Serverless to create structured views over your files in your data lake. And I'm going to take it a step further and show you how you can dynamically create those views uh, using a combination of store procedures and Synapse pipelines. Uh, and I'm going to talk about um, three specific use cases as to why you might need to consider doing that um, based on um, scenarios and experiences that we've had um, whilst delivering Synapse um, projects into production over the past couple of years. I'm going to start though by switching into Synapse Studio uh, and reminding ourselves what Synapse SQL Service actually is. So over here we've got a CSV file. Uh, this is a file in our data lake. If we right click, we can do a new SQL script and do select top 100 rows and we can hit run. And immediately we get some data back, which is the data inside our CSV file. Now what SQL Service has done here is it's pre-populated SQL script using the open row set command to basically query over that CSV file. So I haven't provisioned a database, I've just deployed a Synapse workspace and SQL Serverless is a tool inside the Synapse uh, Studio toolbox, if you like, that's just there out of the box. Um, it's not actually a database, but it gives us the ability to query the files in a structured way using standard uh, T-SQL syntax. So if you've done anything with SQL Server, Azure SQL DB, et cetera, this should all be very familiar. Now that's great. And what if we decide that um, we actually want to turn this uh, this structure we've got here into something a bit more permanent. We want to create a view over that data. We can take it a step uh, further. We can use this SQL syntax here and wrap it in a standard create view statement. And if we run that using the same open row set command in the middle, if we navigate to our SQL serverless pool instance and refresh our views, we can see we now have an orders view which we can query using very standard select everything from our DBO orders view and we get the same data. Okay, happy days. Now, that's great, but uh, I talked about being able to create these views dynamically. Why might you want to do that? Uh, and there's three reasons that we've experienced in projects we've delivered for our customers. The first one is, at the minute we've created a view over one file for orders. What if our data lake contains lots and lots of different types of files? Imagine there's flat file extracts from our kind of ERP or central kind of, um, you know, kind of back office system. We've got orders, we might have products, we might have customers, reviews, returns, all sorts of different things. And maybe, you know, tens, hundreds of different file types. So we don't want to manage kind of very uh, boilerplate kind of code to create all these views over all these uh, different types of data. So we might want to kind of use a convention based approach to loop through all the kind of folders in our data lake and create views accordingly based on some kind of, uh, some kind of pattern matching, if you like. Uh, second reason is that uh, an interesting point to note is that the schema um, in SQL Service Views is enforced when the files are read, right? So it's not enforced when the data is added to the lake. This isn't a database table. We're not trying to get data into a, in a specific schema. But when the view is created, which is when the, the file is queried, that's when the schema is basically being read and essentially enforced. What that means is if you have um, different environments, so you've got a dev environment, you've got a test and a prod environment, quite a standard kind of uh, DTAP kind of topology. If you want to push our changes through those environments, we want to push our schema from dev into test into prod or just deploy into any other environment. We can't actually do that. We can't create these views until that data is in the place that we want it to be. So the kind of second scenario is we might want to be able to create these views programmatically once something else has happened before. Once the ETL process is run and our data has been projected out, at that point we can then kind of create the views. So that means our end-to-end -end deployment process can't be done in one step. It kind of needs to be done by deploying, you know, the, the initial infrastructure and initial kind of stuff we can deploy, then running some kind of process, and then finally deploying the views once the data's in the right place. Uh, the third reason is actually similar, uh, uh, related to the fact that we uh, we don't enforce our scheme until the data is read. And what uh, the, the third reason is that our schema may change over time. We have an evolving schema in our data lake. This may be for all sorts of reasons. It may be completely expected. It may be during the development phase of your data platform. You know, on day one, you may expect, you know, 10 columns in your CSV file and, and, the, and the next week, actually, you need another, another three more. Um, so being able to kind of create these views dynamically, again, maybe at the end of a process, once the data has been spit out the other end, let's just recreate those views every time based on what's in there. Uh, it can be kind of a kind of very uh, low maintenance kind of time saving um, solution. Basically, you're kind of delegating the responsibility of creating the schema of the views to the thing that's creating the data projections that you want to create the views over as well. All these three scenarios are things that we've experienced uh, in real life. Uh, well, the nice thing is, 
is the approach I'm going to show you of how to do this applies to all of those scenarios. So let's go and look at that further. So we've got our view here. Um, first of all, let's just delete our orders view. Uh, I've got a script to do that. Uh, drop view. So let's start again. That's now gone. Um, our view to create the orders is tightly coupled to our orders CSV file at the minute. It's just gonna it's just gonna kind of use that. But what we can do is create a view that's not tightly coupled and is actually kind of convention based and parameterized. So this view here, what we have to actually do is wrap it in a store procedure, and you can create store procedures inside SQL Serverless. So we've got a store procedure called Create SQL Serverless View. And what I'm doing is just passing in a single character, which is name. And that name is being passed into something we all know and love, a bit of, a bit of dynamic SQL. So uh, the name gets passed into here, and we're basically building up dynamically the statement to create the view using the name. Uh, still got the open set command and we're passing the name into the path in the data lake. So it's relying on the convention that our orders would live under an orders folder, products would live on a products folder, et cetera, et cetera. So if we had one view, if we had you know, 100 views, the same thing would apply. We create this store procedure. The store procedure now lives in SQL Serverless and executing it would just be as expect. So if we run this, we now execute our store procedure for orders. We go back to our SQL Serverless pool. Uh, I did delete it. And now we have exactly the same thing again. So that's step one. Now we've got a convention based store procedure that means we can create a view based on any kind of folder path um, that we pass in. And clearly, you know, your own use cases might be different. You might want to change the convention and change the pattern matching and, and, and you might need more parameters than just name. For example, you get you get the principle of kind of what we do. Let's drop this view again. And refresh this again. So that it's gone. Okay, so the second step is now we've got the store procedure. Well, how do we execute it? Now, this is interesting because the Synapse API uh, doesn't support actually being able to execute a SQL query. It uh, supports us pushing those SQL scripts into a Synapse workspace so they're there to be, to be triggered or to be run, if you like. We can't actually execute it through the API. What we can do, though, is we can use standard uh, you know, command line kind of SQL tooling like SQL CMD. We could do that and run it, but also we could do something that's in the box in, in Synapse. We could use Synapse pipelines. So if we go over here, we've got a, a pipeline. Uh, and the first pipeline I'm going to show you is quite simple. Uh, it has one activity, and it's a store procedure activity. Now, the store procedure activity is using a linked service, which I've already set up. And the linked service is actually based on a, um, a, a SQL server um, connection uh, pointing to the um, endpoint for the Synapse serverless that you can obtain from the uh, the, the Synapse uh, pane in, in Azure when you've deployed the workspace. Uh, I'm just pointing to the uh, SQL endpoint and the database I care about and using the Synapse managed identity to connect and you can test that connection to prove it works. Interestingly, there is an out of the box kind of store procedure activity for Synapse, but it only works with the dedicated SQL pools. So if you want to do it with SQL serverless, you can kind of have to go down this route. Once we've got that link service set up, though, we can then call the store procedure, which is our create SQL service view. And in this example, I'm passing in one parameter, which is our name parameter, and hard coding it to orders. So if we trigger that from the Synapse pipeline, basically the, the effect is the same. The pipeline triggers a store procedure, passing in orders, and we should end up with one view again once that's run. So let's look in here. We can see that's succeeded already. Let's go back into our database. Let's refresh the views again. And now we can see we have order views again looking exactly the same. There we go. Right, let's drop that view one last time. So that first pipeline is really useful for um, when you maybe just have like a, an entire set of views you want to create. I pass in one parameter. Clearly, you could extend that further because you could um, you could pass in a pipeline variable that had a whole list of, of strings. You know, you could have 20 views you want to create and you could pass it in and loop through them and do it for each of them. Now extend that slightly further and show you the next pipeline, which is if you want to do that kind of dynamically based on a folder structure, we can extend the pipeline to use a metadata activity that's actually pointing to the uh, data lake as the file system. And it's pointing in this case to kind of the parent folder of where our, our orders folder was. It's getting the child items that's getting passed into a for, for each activity. And for each activity is basically getting, using the parameterized uh, notation, getting the child item. So for every folder in that uh, parent folder, it's calling into the same SQL serverless view activity. And in this case, it's dynamic because it's taking the item name. So basically, it's going to read all the folders for each folder, call into the same activity, and it's going to pass in the folder name and then call the same procedure. So we've run that one to show you how that works. 
I've only got one folder in the data lake, so that the results should be the same. That's winning and it's probably finished already. Here we go, it's in progress. If we dig in, we can see a bit more. There you go, got the folder list for each. So there's only one, created SQL serverless view. Let's go back into our data lake, uh, sorry, database. Uh, I didn't refresh it before, but it's still here. So now we could trigger that at the end of something, right? We could now trigger over an entire data lake set of folders uh, and create the view for each of them. The final thing I wanna show you is actually what might happen is, you know, you've probably got some kind of ETL process before all of that, and, and that happens at the end. So we dig into this pipeline. The ETL process could be as complicated as, uh, as you like, right? There could be all sorts of stuff. In this case, I've just got a copy data activity. And then just to show you, I've got an if condition. It might be, we might want to choose whether to update this schema or not, depending on whether we know the schema has evolved or not. And if that was true, we could then call into the same process. If not, then we could do something else. So we could have some kind of logical gate as to whether we want the, the view to be dynamically created at the end. So it's really that simple. Uh, using a combination of a store procedure and a pipeline, we can basically dynamically create SQL serverless views over our data lake. Uh, and I've explained three reasons why you might want to do that. Just quickly before I wrap up, there's two kind of things to be aware of, two kind of gotchas if you like. Um, the first one is if we look at our view, um, we're relying on Synapse to X basically infer the schema because we're not uh, hard coding a schema in. And if you dig into this in slightly more detail, you can see it's not particularly optimized, especially when we're looking at the varchar columns, it defaults to varchar 8,000. Clearly there's a poten potential kind of performance impact of that if your data is a lot smaller. Um, you could extend that store procedure quite easily to be a bit more uh, granular in terms of what it's going to do based on the kind of data type you're expecting. So there's kind of ways to kind of tweak that. The second thing is to talk about the schema evolution aspect. If you are expecting your schema to change a lot and you want to kind of manage that properly, then you may kind of, your mileage may vary with this approach and you may want to start looking at something like Delta Lake um, using Spark because there's a lot more support for that type of scenarios in that technology. Now that brings us to the end of this talk. Um, hopefully you found it useful. Hopefully you've realized how flexible and powerful a combination of SQL serverless and dynamic view creation in Snaps pipelines can be. So with that, I'll just say thanks for listening and have a great day. Bye-bye.